All right. I wanted to make a case for starch because I think it seems like in the diet world, it's either meat, fruit, meat and fruit, but starch is like, besides McDougal, right? Starch doesn't seem to be like a key player, okay, in health, you know, healthy, these quote unquote healthy diets. And I think maybe... Because because it has to be cooked, because it kind of has to be flavored, I think people overlook it. They they write it off. But I think maybe it's more important than we think. So let's go over a few points. And then I have one point to make at the end, which is why I think maybe it could potentially be better to have more starch in the diet than fruit. Okay? Not necessarily saying you can't eat fruit. I'm just saying... More starch might be beneficial for this reason, okay? So, turns out developing a taste for carbs wasn't a bad thing. So, this is an example of a new study. Um, Here it says, a new study looking at the evolutionary history of the human oral microbiome, so the bacteria in your mouth, shows that Neanderthals and ancient humans adapted to eating starch-rich foods as far back as 100,000 years ago, which is much earlier than previously thought, okay? So these studies, more and more and more are coming out showing that humans have been eating starches for a lot longer than we previously thought. So the findings suggest that such foods became important in the human diet well before the introduction of farming and even before the evolution of modern humans, okay? And while these early humans probably didn't realize it, the benefits of bringing the foods into their diet likely helped pave the way for the expansion of the human brain because of the glucose in starch, which is the brain's main fuel source. Okay, this is going to be important in this video to understand the difference between a starch and a fruit sugar. Starch is purely glucose. Glucose is a monosaccharide. It has one, it's one sugar molecule. Uh, Fruit has sucrose, glucose, and fructose, okay? But basically, if you break it down, it's half glucose because sucrose is made of glucose and fructose. So it's half glucose and half fructose once it gets broken down into your body. And that's different. These are different carbs and they act differently in the body. Glucose is the main sugar in the body. So the you know, once the starch is broken down, it's in the main form. Fructose has to go through more of a process in the liver to get converted to glucose, I believe. And so it's different. It's a different process. So, and the brain's main fuel source is glucose, okay? Um, So it was a seven-year study, blah, blah, blah. They reconstructed the microbiomes, which is really interesting. Okay. The biggest surprise from the study was the presence of particular strains of oral bacteria that are specially adapted to break down starch. These strains, which are members of the genus Streptococcus, have a unique ability to capture starch digesting enzymes from human saliva, which they then use to feed themselves. The genetic machinery of the bacteria uses used to do this, I think they mean used, is only active when starch is part of the regular diet. So starch had to be part of their diet regularly for them to adopt these bacteria. And both the Neanderthals and the ancient humans that scientists studied had these starch adapted strains in their dental plaque, while most of the primates who feast almost exclusively on non-starchy plant parts like fruit, stems, and leaves had almost no streptococci that could break down starch. So this is a huge difference that humans have that they've probably had for hundreds of, like a hundred thousand years. And these are gorilla teeth and human teeth. So The findings also push back on the idea that Neanderthals were top carnivores, given that the brain requires glucose as a nutrient source and meat alone is not a sufficient source. Okay, so 
researchers said the finding makes sense because for hunter-gatherer societies around the world, starch-rich foods, roots, tubers, and forbs, as well as nuts and seeds, for example, are important and reliable nu nutrition sources. In fact, starch currently makes up about 60% of calories for humans worldwide. So we haven't stopped eating that source of food either, if, if this is correct, right? I always like to leave a margin of error in there. It might not be true, but... Okay, so that's one article I have here. And this is just another one kind of along the same lines. So there, this is an anthropology type article. And we propose that plant foods containing high quantities of starch were essential for the evolution of the human phenotype during the Pliocene. <clears throat> so although previous studies have highlighted a stone tool mediated shift from from primarily plant-based to primarily meat-based diets as critical in the development of the brain and other human traits, we argue that digestible carbohydrates were also necessary to accommodate the increased metabolic demands of a growing brain. Furthermore, we acknowledge the adaptive role cooking played in improving the digestibility and palatability of key carbohydrates. We provide evidence that cooked starch, a source of preformed glucose, here again, glucose, greatly increased energy availability to human tissues with high glucose demands, such as the brain, red blood cells, and the developing fetus. This is another interesting point here. I didn't know red blood cells relied so much on glucose, uh, but apparently they do. So it's good to have some form of glucose in your body. We also highlight the auxiliary role. Copy number variation in salivary amylase genes may have played an increasing the importance of starch in human evolution following the origins of cooking. Okay, blah, blah, blah. So another article just pointing out how important starch probably was in the human diet. Now, one huge difference between us and primates, I think there's also other differences like our colons are shorter, our large intestines are larger, but people can fluff that off. But you can't fluff this fact off that our brains are three to four times larger than that of a chimpanzee. Yes, we're, we're bigger as well, but we're not three to four times bigger. Our brains are just three to four times bigger. So that's really, really, really important that we need so much more energy to run our brains. And I guess it could be argued, well, just eat more fruit, you know, just eat more of it. But you're still getting half the amount of glucose in, that you would in a starch right? Because fruit is always going to be half fructose, half glucose. And there is, there are some issues with fructose, with eating too much fructose. So fructose has to be metabolized by the liver, it says here, where it promotes the synthesis of fat. So you're going to be making fat. Some people don't think we can make fat and we need to eat saturated fat. That's not true. We can make all the saturated fat we need. Um, in fact, some experts believe our bodies are not designed to handle the excess fructose we consume today. The liver's primary role in fructose metabolism can lead to an overload of fat and other substances in the liver, contributing to non-alcoholic fatty, fatty liver disease and other liver-related issues. So for some reason, I thought the fructose turned into glucose, but does it just turn into fat? Can you let me know that in the comments? Or can we also make glucose from the fructose? Or... Is that fructose all basically just turned to fat and then we have to turn the fat to glucose, which is a really long process. Let's find out. Okay, yes, I forgot this point that um, fructose is converted to glucose in the small intestine where it is phosphorylated to fructose 1-phosphate, which is then converted to glucose 6-phosphate. This conversion occurs in the liver and is an important step in the metabolism of fructose. Okay. It's converted to glucose in the small intestine and the conversion, oh, I guess the second conversion here, I don't know what they're saying here. The conversion occurs in the liver. Um, fructose can also be con converted to glucose in the liver where it is stored as glycogen. Okay, stored as glycogen, which can be broken down to glucose phosphate. Okay, so glucose, it sounds like fructose takes a little while to be able to get to your brain, 
which is surprising. So you'd have to almost eat even more fruit. Do you get what I'm saying here? Fruit is already only half glucose and then your brain needs more than a chimpanzee. So you'd have to eat like way more fruit. Does that make sense? Um, whereas if you just eat starch, you get the fuel right away after starch is broken down, which is a bit of a process too. I'm not going to lie. It is, but at least it's in glucose form the minute you break it down. Okay. And then fructose um, can cause issues with liver damage in overconsumption may result in insulin resistance, oxidative stress, inflammation, elevated uric acid levels, increased blood pressure, and increased triglyceride concentrations. Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is a term widely used to describe excessive fatty infiltration in the liver because it's converted to fat as well for some reason. I, I'm not really sure like how much of it gets converted to fat, how much goes to glycogen, da 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 Don't really get that part. This is another interesting part down here. Excess fructose metabolism in intestinal cells reduces production of proteins that maintain the gut barrier, leading to a leaky gut and potentially contributing to fatty liver disease. So again, if you're eating too much, not sure what too much means, but if you're eating too much of it, um, you might create a leaky gut. And I wonder if that's why when I was eating so much fruit back in the day, I started developing like all these allergies to like different things. Maybe it's too much, too much fructose. Who knows? And then again, it's related to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Um, yeah. So in a way, in a way, I'm just going to throw this out here. Maybe starch is actually better for cleaning out the body, let's say, like, um, what's the word? Like detoxing. If detoxing is a thing, your liver detoxes your body, right? If you can alleviate the liver of having to process any excess fructose, then potentially you might be able to process more other things out of your body. Does that make sense? So your liver can focus on other things. It doesn't have to focus on the fru fructose so much. Maybe the starch is better for that. It's just, it's just an idea. And again, I'm not saying only eat starch. I'm not saying, I'm not, I'm actually not telling you guys to do anything. You guys should make up your own minds and you should do what you want to do. But a case for eating starch, even uh, in like um, body, kind of like a healing sense, could make sense if you want to alleviate your liver of all the having to pro process fructose all the time. Just an idea. Okay, well, that's my article on starch. I do think humans are well adapted to starch, like 100,000 years. That's way longer than previously thought. And that's, it says here, we adapted to it even before we became, yeah, here, right here. Findings suggest such foods became important in the human diet well before the introduction of farming and even before the evolution of modern humans. So before we became Homo erectus or Homo sapien, Homo sapien, that's the modern one, right? We were eating starch before we took our last form, <laughs> our last, what? I don't know. I feel like I'm, I'm playing Pokemon here with my kids. Our, our last Evolvo. <laughs> Okay. Um, before that even happened, we were started to eat starch. So it's clearly, we're adapted to it. We're clearly adapted to it. There's no doubt in my mind. And it does appear that it's better to be eating starch that is cooked because starch that's uncooked really doesn't get digested much in the small intestine. You won't get much from it. It's going to go all the way st straight through to your microbiome, which is not a bad thing because the microbiome in the colon, um, and the, and the large intestine uses the resistant starch, right? And makes butyrate and actually it creates short chain fatty acids that are healthy and, and feeds the good bacteria. I don't know where Paul Saladino got that stuff about it causing inflammation because all I've read today is how good it is for the microbiome. So, yeah. So I, I think... This stuff is, is probably part of our diet in its cooked form. And I think that's hard for people to get around in their brains sometimes. It's like, 
what we have to eat a cooked food because it's not natural, right? To cook our food. We have to eat a cooked food and you're going to potentially leach out some of the nutrients because through boiling or like you, you might add an AGE, you know, um, the Maillard reaction and create like cancerous substances. This is better. This is our food. How can this be our food? And I think maybe it is. I think maybe it, it is part of our food. But it's it's kind of hard to wrap your brain around when you've been so like raw food hypnotized or whatever. <laughs> you've been, yeah, told that raw food is, raw is law, right? And it's hard to wrap your brain around that. But potentially the starch might be better. And maybe there's, there's probably downsides to it as well. But anyway, um, I digress. So some kind of combination of starch, fruits, veggies, and potentially animal foods in the past. I'm not convinced that you necessarily need the animal foods when you have access to pulses, beans and stuff. But that's a debate for another time. Okay, we'll see you then.